welcome to, it, to each of you. It's so good to see everyone here this morning. But it is great to see you, my friend. The truck is running great. If you have a really good mechanic, we have a really good mechanic back here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Keith. And I see we have some visiting friends. I haven't met you, but it's good to have you. Where, where are you coming from? In the Canada, we're welcome. We're glad to have you at our humble community here. And of course, uh, you're no longer visitors. We're, we're happy to have you. And those we haven't seen for a while. And uh, it's always good to see Jack, Jacqueline, right? Jacqueline. Okay. Uh, I'll probably make that mistake again. If I could get some lights up here, it would be great. This morning, as I contemplate the past year, is that good? As I contemplate the past year, I know we're going to the month of February, but for many of us, last year was an extremely, in fact, the past two years have been extremely challenging. A lot of change for most of us, and uh, things will quite likely never be the same. Uh, so you've heard the term as a, a new normal, whatever that means. It means that life will never be the same the way we were used to. What do you say? You know what I'm talking about? Now, when I was, it was a very difficult year, uh, but I was not to have transitioned from one year to the next. We have gone through the month of January, and now we have come to the middle of February. And if you were to reflect on the past, then definitely you would envision some trials, some hard times, some tragedies, some loss of life, loss of family members. Uh, some of you have experienced a heartbreak and suffering. Tragedies and pain. You may remember the times that you felt like you were being knocked down. You get up and you're knocked down again. Over and over and over. Trouble sometimes. But praise the Lord, you are here today. To God be the glory. And the interesting thing is that you have chosen to be here. You woke up this morning, you got dressed, and you made the effort to be here this morning. It tells me that Jesus is still working in your life. What do you say? And I can't, I'm confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. My friends, the Lord is working within God. Can I get an amen? And you know, sometimes I'm very rocked by the challenges of life. We begin to doubt and murmur. We begin to complain. In fact, we may even begin to question God. And sometimes our faith is rocked to the point where we question God. We find ourselves questioning our own faith. No matter how hard we try, things just aren't going our way. And I contemplate my experiences over the past few years, and it seems as though, Mike, I'm, I'm trying to go in this direction, it's just not working. I try to go in this direction, things just don't seem to work. Uh, then sickness comes in the family, then there's a death, and uh, it's just, you know, I think about, Lord, we go to I go to church, we go to church, uh, things just aren't going right. We have had our Red Sea experience with mountains on either side, the Egyptian ones that seem to be behind us, and we, in faith, we step out in faith, but for some reason the waters didn't part. 
I'm not going to run like that. I'm going to get a testimony this morning. Have you had that experience? Uh, the, 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 the worst is I did not talk. We're standing there, a saturated in water, dripping. There is no place in land to cross over on. Our faith is changed, but what is this thing called faith, my friends? What is this thing called faith? And uh, what does biblical mathematics have to do with faith? Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we contemplate the great mysteries of your holy word, I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to give us an understanding that will strengthen our, our faith. That we may have a steadfast and secure anchor to hold on to. O oh, Lord, we praise your name. Give our thoughts as we venture into your holy word. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. May all God's children say, Amen. If you return with me to the book of Hebrews, as our scripture reading was read so well this morning for us by Sister Diana. Hebrews chapter 11. If you turn there quickly with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Anybody remember what verses we read? One, two, and three. Excellent. Somebody's paying attention today. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. And follow along with me as I share it with you. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance of what, everybody? The things hoped for. The girl wants to say the evidence, the evidence, evidence, the evidence of things that you have not seen. Almost seems contradictory, doesn't it? Maybe not contradictory, but difficult to understand. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and then we see for it by the elders obtained a good report. And verse 3 says, Through faith, for what is the body? Through faith we understand, so with faith we begin to what? Understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Have mercy. Uh, the, word, the Hebrews word, the Hebrews actually, the Hebrews defines faith as we see, as the assurance of things that were hoped for, a conviction, so to speak. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, <coughs> there would be one minute. Yeah, let me have that. <coughs> Some water to drink here. Just bear with me. But here we have, thank you very much. Hebrews defining faith as the, thank you, as the assurance of things that we hope for, something that we have convicted by something that we have not seen. Now, with this type of a definition, we have been accused as Christians of having blind faith. But what is meant by blind faith? The concept of blind faith, my friends, is not found in Scripture. It's something that we've come up with. But the Hebrew word for faith, by its very definition, follow carefully with me now, the Hebrew definition of faith, by its definition, refers to a logical, robust, unwavering confidence in the truth. Let me repeat that for you. When the Bible refers to faith, it is established on something that it is, it is logical, it's realist, it's unwavering, and it's a, that's the type of confidence that we have in something that is true. Are you with me? You follow me this morning so far? Okay. So faith, as commended in God's word, is being sure about something that was not witnessed firsthand. For example, we were not around during the creation experience, right? But we have faith based on what we see around that creation occurred. Uh, uh, it, that's something in the past, or it may be something that occurred. It may be something that has not yet occurred. For example, the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has not occurred, but we're moving forward based on our faith, our confidence. By this definition, we could conclude that 
our own faith is born. So if we, if we can see something, then faith is no longer operative. And I would think, if I can see that, I don't need faith to believe it. It becomes a new idea. The fact is, my friends, that everybody relies on this thing called faith. Evolutionists, in their version <coughs> on their theory of origins, and their faith. In fact, that's a greater faith that I think many of us dare to even venture onto. Uh, <coughs> passengers in a car. You get in the car, two things. The passenger has faith that you will do a good job. The driver has faith that when he jumps into his car and turns the ignition, that it's going to start. This morning on our way to church, I didn't go out and, and say, I wonder if it's going to start this morning and test it and work on it. I have, we, we got out, we went, and we had faith, and we switched the ignition, and the car started. That's tr- a certain amount of faith. Are you ready? Okay. So, <laughs> children, have you ever seen children at Christmas? They have faith that they receive a gift for Christmas. Also, are relying on something, my friends, that we have not seen. Some faith may be unwarranted, and no doubt this is what's meant by blind faith. I understand that. We have unrealistic expectations of things that are, are not practical. But in contrast, the Christian faith is both reasonable and justified. It is founded upon God's consistent and reliable word, which is what we will take a look at today. And while it does not require external proof, it is compatible with the physical evidences that are all around us. For example, God may be invisible, but His qualities are clearly seen in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 10, and I'll read that for you. It says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You and I, my friends, have no excuse to not have faith in the creation of this world. We are without excuse to understand and to have faith in God's holy word. The very language of the Hebrew Old Testament reveals that our faith is intrinsically linked to truth. Now, the two words for faith, for, for faith and truth, and we're going to be taking a look here, and I, <coughs> follow with me here, as we begin to delve, delve into the subject today. I would like to clarify here, we have faith, and let's hope this works here, faith and truth. And I like this because I, 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 it's hard for me to say. It's, in fact, I'll just say it here, but we're dealing with faith and truth. E N U N A H. How do you say that? Emuna and Emet. So we have E N U N A. I'll just write this here. E M U N A. And I think it has an H. That's faith. And the word for truth is Emet. In the Bible, these words are sometimes translated interchangeably. So let's follow with me here now. Faith and truth are often used interchangeably. Can you see, based on what we've said so far, why that would be the case? Because faith is based on truth. Are you with me? Okay. So now we have here that both Hebrew words are derived from the same Hebrew word, root word, iman, meaning fullness, a certainty, a reliability. So rather than, rather than being nebulous, so rather than being vague, biblical faith, like truth, it is sure, it is certain. This is faith. So the question I'd like to ask this morning is, how is your faith. How is your faith? And I would like to establish a foundation of truth to demonstrate, my friends, that we can trust God. And Father, have mercy upon us as we go through this lesson today. 
May your Holy Spirit guide us, us, help me to understand, to be able to explain and express. So, Father, thank you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we establish a foundation for truth that we can trust in God, I pray that as we continue out in this troublesome time ahead of us, I venture to, to say, without being prophetic, that things are not going to get any easier. I believe that thing that our lives will become more, more and more challenging year after year. And so we need to be able to establish our faith to the point where we trust fully upon Jesus Christ. And then as we come to the end of our discussion this morning, you must make a decision. You see, we all must make decisions in life, but your decision of faith will be based on the sure word of God. But we'd like to have that foundation. Now, mathematics, as you've seen in the bulletin, mathematics is our topic of discussion today. What, is it, what, what does the title say? Biblical mathematics and exact science. Biblical mathematics and exact science. This is a tool that I would like to use to take your attention to the profound prophecies in the Bible. <clears throat> we shall establish today by mathematical proof that Jesus Christ and I'll put it right there. This is the focus of all that we're talking about, so I'm going to put it in bold here. <clears throat> that Jesus Jesus the Christ, <clears throat> he was the anointed one. Have you heard that term before? We'd like to establish that Jesus the Christ is the Messiah. We'd like to establish that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Savior of the world. Because, my friends, if you have any doubts whatsoever in your mind that Jesus Christ is the appointed, anointed one by God, then your foundation will be weak and shaky. We need to walk out of here today with full confidence, understanding why it is that we have accepted a Jesus Christ as our Savior. And I will venture to share with you mathematical proof which is an exact science to demonstrate to you that we can have confidence in Jesus. Would you like to see that? Are you ready to see that? Did you know that the Bible is full of mathematics and English and literature and all sorts of other things in history? We're going to use historical evidence along with biblical proof to demonstrate why we believe the way we believe. So if you take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 8. What book of the Bible did I say, everybody? Daniel chapter, chapter 8, and we will look at several verses of Scripture in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Turn with me to the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 8, and we will read several verses together, or you'll follow with me here. So I'd like to take your attention to verse 14. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, everybody. In fact, let me write it up here for you. We're looking, we're looking at the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. I want you to be able to have some references when you leave here. So, Daniel chapter 8, and we're starting at 14. There are going to be several other verses to go along there, but you will be able to remember when you go home what we were talking, what we were talking about. Uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, follow with me here. It says, And he said unto me, and uh, unto 2,300 days, who's speaking here? This is Daniel, right? This is Daniel. Uh, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now follow us, we jump down to verse 16. And he said, here we see verse 16, it says, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, Make this man to understand the vision. Make this man to what, everybody? 
to understand the, the vision. So in chapter 8, Daniel is given a vision, and it appears, my friends, that he did not understand the vision. Just above what we read, it says, And he said unto me, unto 2,000, verse 14, I'm going back up to four, verse 14, Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So it appears that Daniel himself did not understand the vision. I was following so far. But check this out now. Go to cha- verse, 17, verse 27, rather, cha- the same chapter 8, verse 27, it says, I have Daniel, now remember, when you're reading verse 27, Gabriel has given Daniel understanding. Are you following the setup? Are you with me? And, and it says, 27 says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days, after that, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. My friends, Daniel was Daniel was overwhelmed. He fainted, and when he recuperated, he prayed for his instructor to return to finish explaining the vision. So let's go now to chapter nine. And look at verse 21. We're trying to get a background of where, where all these numbers come from. We'll, we'll take a look at it. Chapter 9, verse 21 says, Yea, I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, I'm just going to pause here. Just, this is just for a side bit. It says here that he was touched about the time of the evening oblation. The word oblation, uh, in, in generally used in biblical terms, is to give an offering. The evening oblation here uh, in, in the Jewish ministry, anybody know what time the evening oblation was? It was about 3 o'clock when they had the offering, when they were making the sacrifice. Okay, It was about 3 p.m. So keep that in the back of your minds here. Okay, and verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me, and said, O oh Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. So the angel returns to explain to Daniel the meaning of the 2300 day prophecy. God gives Daniel a vision that was to take place some 500 years into the future. An angel is commissioned to explain the vision to Daniel. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to see the provision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, I know that was a mouthful, but just hang in there with me. We'll go through this. So what we see here in verse Uh, Chapter 9, verse 24, that the 70 weeks are determined. Now, 70 weeks are a measure of time. Gabriel states that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, when this prophecy was given, the Jews were God's anointed people. I I, I remember the Jewish nation was God's chosen people. So this first part deals especially with the Jewish nation, so he specifically said, determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That holy city then would refer to what, what everybody? J- Jerusalem, right? Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. Now we have some numbers to work with. We have 2,300 days. That is the span of the time period that we're talking about. So let's do this here. Let me get my green marker. And I'll try and draw a line. I'm going to try and illustrate this with a timeline. So here we have a timeline. And just imagine, if you would, that this is zero, and this is 2,300 days. Okay? Now, you'll notice here that it says, it says here that the word, that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, you need to understand that the word determined in Hebrew means to cut off. Are you with me? The word determined means to cut off. You can look that up. But that in the original Hebrew, that's what it, mean, and it means. In other words, the 70 weeks are a segment or a part of this 2300-day segment. Are you with me so far? It's important that you follow this, this concept here, okay? 
So let's take this, let's do this. So let's take 70 weeks and cut it off of the 2300 days. But wait, before we do that, we need to do a little mathematics, right? 70 weeks, how do we convert 70 weeks to 2300 days? What do we need to do? Multiply by what? 7, and then we'll get 400 and 490 days. Is everybody see that? Okay, if you miss up to the point here, you need to let me know so that we, because it's, everything bears on each other, okay? So 490 days. Now, we're also, let's put some other more math here while we're here. The 2300 days, so this, this here, let's put this on here. And I'm going to, just for the sake of illustration, it's not going to be, um, what's the word? Um, proportionate. So from here, I'm going to come way up here. And then what I do here, just so that you're aware, is that it actually there's a missing piece over there. This, this proportionately will go much further out, but I don't have space to do that. Okay, so let's do this here now. So 70, the 70 weeks is 490 days. So we have, I'm, I put right here 400, it's a little small, but I hope you can bear with me. 490 what, everybody? 490 days. Now the 490 days was determined, was to, determined to who? We said it, what people? The, it's for the Jews, right? So this was for the, the Jewish people. So this was determined to the Jews. Okay, so now we're setting up a little bit of a parameter to work with. Let's go ahead a little bit deeper. If we take, uh, let's see how much time is left. If you have, uh, if we have 2300, and we have taken off 490, Hold on, let me make sure that I'm doing this correctly. Yes, I am. 490, let's subtract that. Anybody figure that out? 0 from 0 is 0, 9 from 10 is what? 1, 5 from 13 is what? Double check me, am I right? 1810? That's about right. Okay, so over here we have 1810. That's 1,810 what? That's days, right? And this, this was appointed to, this, this, this first section was for the Jews, and this section here now would be for the Gentiles. Okay? All right. Hmm, interesting. Let's take a closer look at this here now. So we have two sections. The first section, uh, 490 days allotted to the Jews, and the second section, the 810 days allotted to the Gentiles. Now, an important concept in understanding of prophecy is understanding prophetic time. Very important that we understand that. And we have, we have that in Ezekiel. Uh, anybody remembers where that is? Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6 is one area. So, okay, I'm putting these texts here. Of course, 8. We have Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. And then now we have Ezekiel. What did I say? Ezekiel 1? 4 verse 6. Can anybody think of another reference where prophetic time is referred to? Uh, Numbers. That's exactly right. Numbers chapter 14 verse 34. So here we have a Numbers. Uh, I'm told not to use my fingers and I did it again. Sorry. Numbers. Numbers what? 1434. Okay, we can look that up. We can look that up later. I'm giving that to you for reference. Uh, but here we have that uh, the Lord is appointing each day for a year. So when we're dealing with prophetic time, we see that a day, a, a, a day rather, is represented as a year. So if we use this principle, the 2300 days now becomes what? So we have 2300 years. And all of these will be transitioned from days to years. Am I, is this making sense, everybody? Okay. All right, follow along with me here now. So, the first section for the Jews, we've, we've done that. The second section for the Gentiles. But the close of this prophetic time period, the close of this prophetic time period for the Jews brings us to the exact time period at the exact actual year, let me rephrase this, 
the end of this, let me just deal with this whole timeline first. The end of this prophetic time period brings us to the exact time when we will have the cleansing of the sanctuary which is in heaven. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 says, And he said unto me, After 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Are you with me? That's the end of the 2,300 day prophecy. Now with that said, in order for us to move forward with this time prophecy, we must know when to start. If we cannot figure this out, then we're going to be in big, big trouble. We'll never be able to interpret it, right? Makes sense. Let's see if we can figure if the Bible tells us where it starts. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Daniel 9, verse 25. Now follow along. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah, the Prince, that's talking about who? Jesus shall be seven weeks. See that? And then it goes on to say, and three score and two weeks, we're looking at verse uh, 25, it says, and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the world even in trouble sometimes. So here we have some more our numbers to work with. Let's see if we can take a look at that. The angel instructed uh, Daniel that the 70 weeks or the 490 year period was to begin at the time when the decree was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So what we're looking here now, we're looking for the time of the decree. The decree to restore, let me, I don't need to write this. The decree to restore and and what rebuild rebuild what Jerusalem. If we can find that date, then we can know where to start. So let's see if we can find that date. When was the decree given? <coughs> it's chronicled in Ezra chapter seven. Was, uh, but we can go out to six for six, Ezra six. Let's go to Ezra six, verse fourteen. Let me write that down here. In fact, I'll put it here so that you can see that what it's referring to. This is Ezra, Ezra chapter six, and it's verse fourteen. Ezra six, verse fourteen, and the story is actually chronicled of the actual event of seven in chapter seven. Verses 12 to 28. Okay, as we write sideways, hopefully you can follow here. But verse 14 in chapter 6 of Ezra says, And they did it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Xerxes, king of Persia. Follow carefully now. So there were three kings that were involved in issuing the decree. And Ezra received the final authority to restore the temple in the year 457 B.C. So 457 B.C. This is uh, historically sound and biblically correct. You can do the research on that. But we do see that, and, and you will see that the, the uh, Artaxerxes, of the three kings, Artaxerxes was the one who actually provided the financial uh, funding, and he also transferred the authoritative power, the governing power, allowing Ezra to continue with the work of rebuilding Jerusalem. And that is the date that has been established as the giving of the decree. Okay, so <coughs> God tells us uh, God tells us that we have to count the 490 years of this prophecy from the day when the command was given. So we have the year 457 BC or 457 years before Christ. BC meaning before Christ. Now this is where it gets really exciting. Okay, we're just setting up the, the, the foundation here. All right, it may have been a little challenging, uh, but it gets really, really exciting here. Check this out. The proph this prophecy was given to Daniel some 500 years before the event was to take place. 
Just think about that. And the event was that Christ was to be born. <laughs> Watch out now. It was actually, it actually foretold when the Messiah would begin his ministry and when he would be crucified on the cross. Just for this. Hang on to your seats. Check this out. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Daniel 9, verse 25. It says, Know ye therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So you ready for some more mathematics? Let's check this out. Let's add these weeks together. We have, set, we have, so I need some help here. Seven weeks. I hope, let's see, I may have to erase some things. We have seven weeks. And then what else do we have? We have what? Three score and two. Three score, what is a score? What is a score? Twenty. So if we have three score, what is that? So we have another six, everybody following that? We have a 60 week period. And then what was left? And, and how much left? How many weeks? Two. We have two weeks left. All right. Let's add this up. What do you get? 69 weeks. Okay, I know I'm getting a little short on space here, but just bear with me. We have 69 weeks. So, we want to put this into our equation. What do we need to do with weeks? We need to transfer it to? Well, before we transfer it to years, we have to go, right, we have to go into days. How do we get it to days? We multiply it by 7, and that equals what? <laughs> You just double check me on my math here, but I came up with 483. You can double check me on that. And if we use the principle of prophetic time, that would be what? 483 years. Okay, so we have 483 years. Now follow carefully with me now, because we must take the date of the decree. The date of the decree was what? 457. Is it okay if I erase some of this? I can really erase some of this so we have some more room to work. Okay, so now we need to take the the 483 and we subtract it from the 457. Remember, we're looking for where does this where does this take us in this prophecy? Okay. So it says, unto this time, okay? So in order to find that time, we need to subtract. If we subtract seven, remember this is 483 years. But we're behind the BC line by only 457 years. Are you with me? So we need to pay careful attention to what happens here. If I was to subtract seven from 13, what do I get? Six. Six from eight. Okay, so 457 from 483, however you do your math, I know I do math um, a different way that many people do it, but you come up with what? And I call it, you're double checking me, 26, all right? Is that, are, are you with me? Yeah. Am, I confused, am I confusing you? Totally confusing you? Okay, we come up with 26, but look, something very interesting happened here. We crossed over from BC into AD, and if you can, I, I put this here, then I'm going to erase it. If we're coming backwards, you know, you ever notice it goes 457, 456, 455, and it goes down, right? So let's say we get down to the year 4, 3, 2, 1. This is the, this is the, this is BC, then we cross over into AD. What happens? What's this year going to be here? 1, 2, 3. Of course, that's after Christ. There's an interesting thing here. You notice how many ones do you have? We have two ones, and there's no zero, right? So, when we transfer from BC to AD, we need to add a year. Are you with me? So, we add a year, and we come up with what? We come up with AD 27. That is amazing. When did Jesus Christ start his ministry? AD. 
let's make some space here so that you can see it. AD 27. I don't know about you, but this is profound. I mean, this is historical itself. This is historical itself. And now, biblically, we can see as we reflect, we see that God gave Daniel a vision, a prophetic vision, showing that when Jesus Christ had started his, his mission. Can I get an amen this morning? This is amazing. Jesus, John, under the inspiration of God, announces to all those that were gathered on the banks of Jordan that Jesus is the Savior of the world. We see that in John chapter 1, verse 9, where John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Tell me that Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Are you still following me, my friends? My friends, the Bible tells us that John leads Jesus down into the watery grave in the river. He buries him under the water, and he brings him up out of the water, and immediately the heavens open. The Holy Spirit comes down in the likeness of a dove, and the Father declares from heaven that Jesus is his very own Son. All right. That takes us to that. Now, let me, I, should, I should establish some of the things here for us that are historically sound. I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to remove these texts here. Hopefully you got those. And then we need, to, we need to establish some things here. One of the things that we do know of is that Jesus began his ministry in AD 27. AD 27. He also, uh, when did Jesus die? What year? This is historically sound. When, when was it? AD 31. Is that correct? Okay. What time did he die? Does anybody know, you know, we know what, what time did he die? He died in the afternoon at... AD 31 at 3 p.m. Okay. These are historical... Some facts. Let me see what else we can establish. Is there anything else we can establish here? <clears throat> Let me just take a quick look. All right, we'll go with that for now. So here we see that Jesus was anointed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and after his anointing, what happened? He was taken into the wilderness to be tempted. You remember that? Jesus began his work in the fall of 27 AD, exactly the precise time that had been prophesied. Now, did you know that Jesus himself recognized that from studying scripture? Listen to what he said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. You can write this one down also. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus says that the time is fulfilled. What time was he referring to? He was referring to the 483 time year time prophecy. Oh, here we are. 83, the, the 483 year time prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Let me see if I can put some clarity on that imagery here. So here, 8027, when Jesus, I'm going to widen this up. Yeah, this is good. Can you see this here somehow? But here we have Jesus. Jesus was baptized. That's when his ministry began. Okay? Hopefully you can see that there. Okay, let's look a little deeper here. Let me put this back here out of my way. All right, so we have established the fact that Jesus began his ministry in AD 27, and it brings us to the end of the 69 weeks. So here, I should, I should put this here for you for clarity. I'm going to erase this so that we can see. I, I kind of need this here, right here, for right now. But we've established that this is a 69 weeks. This right here is a 69 weeks. From here to here, I give this ministry. I should have given myself more space there. I'm going to remove this so that you can see that more clearly. I'll remove this. I'll remove all of this so that you can see, you can see more clearly. So we have a 69-week period here, but we were told that there was a 70-week period And that 70-week period we're going to mark off right here. So we have right here. Now, how much time is left? How much time is left? One week. Don't be shy. We have 70 weeks. 
We've got up to 69 weeks, and we see how much time is left. One week is left. So, remember, Daniel 9 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. So we have just one week left. So let's read verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, if you follow with me, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to, to cease. In the midst of the week. So if we have a week in the middle of the week, if we have seven days that make a week, what will be the middle of the week? Three and a half. Three and a half days. Of course, now we're trying to really transition to a prophetic time, so that would equal what? Three and a half years. Let me not put equal here. That will be three and a half years. In the middle of the week, what would happen? What would happen in the middle of the week? He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, to come to an end. Remember, they had to make the, the, the sacrifices. And now those sacrifices pointed to who? The, Jesus Christ. We have type and anti-type. So here we see that the Bible is referring to the, uh, the, in the midst of the last week of the 70, the Messiah would be cut off. Notice in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it says, it shall, He shall be cut off, but not for Himself. Just ponder those words for a moment. Just try to fathom that. The great love of God, the tremendous love of God, speaking these words, recognizing that His Son will be cut off, but not for anything that He has done. It's for you and for you and for me. This tremendous